Hello, hello, hello everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back to my channel. Cheryl Hubbard Show. And so, Cheryl Hubbard Show. So today, let's just talk, I want to talk just a little bit about, uh, you know, some different law terms. So, you know, first of all, I want to say glad you can be here, glad to see you, glad, glad you can join me. So, this is a book right here. One of the books that I that I used when I was just, uh, no, I was, I think this was an online course I took, uh, oh, I think it was a law program, but I didn't, I didn't get a law degree, but I got like a law certificate, a little certificate, but it's constitutional law, I think it was a, I think it was a criminal justice program, matter of fact, constitutional law and the criminal justice system. And then, uh, so this is one book I want to pull some terms out of that one. And this book right here, I used when I was at Australia University. It's called uh, Business Law, and it's some good information in here, so I want to go over a few things in this book, too. But first, uh, let's get into it. Let's get into some of these law terms. I know uh, I have done a few... Uh, uh, videos on, uh, you know, talking about a few law terms, but I have mostly, I think I've done like accounting tutorials, but let's talk about, let's just talk a little bit about contracts, okay? What is a contract? So a contract is a, I, I guess I would say a legal agreement, a legal agreement between two or more people to refrain, to do something or refrain from doing something. So that's what it is, a legal agreement between two or more people. It could be five, I guess. I guess it could be up to five people. Maybe more than that, but you you agree to do something or you agree to refrain from doing something. In other words, we have a contract. Say, for instance, I have a contract with five other people and um, somebody, uh, the gentleman wanted us to paint his house. He got, you know, he wanted us to paint the whole house. So the gentleman wanted us, wanted us to paint his house, there's five of us, and we agreed. So first of all, he offered, first of all, he offered, that would be the first, so it's six elements, and all six elements have to be present. So he offered us, he offered it to us, he said, well, will you paint our house, my house? You could, he might, somebody might say, paint our house, paint my house, uh, or it could be, you know, wash my car, or Whatever the contract entails, you know, so that would be an offer. Then if we accept it, mutual assent. So he offered it. He offered it, we accepted it, mutual assent, consideration. He said, Well, I'll pay y'all, I'll pay y'all two thousand. Ten, uh, five thousand. That would be a uh, consideration. So he offered us. Uh, he said, "Well, we all we all paint my house. I will give all five of y'all two thousand dollars." We all agreed on it, so that would be a mutual assent. And then he came up and said, um, uh, right, I'll give y'all 2000 I'll give y'all 5000 That would be a consideration. And then we also have, uh, we will have capacity because we are not minors. That would be four. So we are not minors. We are of age. And we can enter into a contract. So that would be four. So number five. And then we have six. So five, let's say five, let's say offer, mutual assent, uh, consideration, mutual, mutual assent, consideration, capacity, and we also have legality.
So you have a contract, you have an offer. Okay, I think that the, 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 I should have had an acceptance should have been uh, the second one. But I put it down here. So the legality means it has to be a legal contract. It can't be a uh, legal, you know, illegal uh, drug deal or anything of that nature. So it has to be a legal contract. You know, it has to be legal. You can't have a contract. Uh, say, look, y'all go rob this bank. Uh, you know, drop a contract with somebody rob a bank. He said, I give you five thousand dollars, or I give you five hundred to hit that person in the head. You know, with this brick. You know, all, that would be illegal. So can't do nothing like that. So it has to be. That's why I have to have uh, legality. It has to be legal. And the other one I said was um, acceptance. So we have to have an uh, offer, they offered it, we accepted, we all agreed, mutual assent, he gave us some consideration that uh, $5,000, and we had a capacity, we were, we were not minors, we were all 18 and over, and um, legality, it was, it was a legal contract, it was a legal contract, it wasn't nothing illegal. So that's a contract. So it's an agreement, and it's all different types of contracts. You know, I'm not a, a law student, but I took a little bit. Um, I think I took um, I think it was three three law classes at different schools. I think I took I think I took a law class with uh, Liberty University. I had uh, I have a, I still had that law book, and I took a law class with uh, I think it was. Um, uh, I don't know if it was Phoenix University, but I know it was Strand University. I know it was Liberty University and Strand University. I did take a law class with them two uh, schools, and then I have another law because I have three law books. So I had, and I think this is um, this might be Stratford. This might be a core uh, online course called Stratford. It's a constitutional law and a criminal justice system. So that is that. That's just you know, just wanted to mention that. About contract, so I want to get into uh, just a few, you know, terms. You know, just a few terms um, in the book. You know that you know much needed. You know, you know. You, sometimes you need to go over your fourth amendment rights. Go over all your amendments. You have, uh, I think it's twenty, twenty seven amendments. 27 amendments you need to go, you know, I need to go over some of them too. You know, you had the First Amendment, uh, freedom of speech and religion, Second Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. Uh, so, you know, you had your Fourth Amendment, your Fifth Amendment, it's different, you know, we all need to go over our amendments. It's good. You know, all these amendments to the Constitution. Uh, so, let's start out with, um, I wasn't a law student, but I, you know, I did, you know, maintain my books and I try to read over them every now and again. So let's start with, uh, let's basically let's start out with the Constitution. The Constitution. So we have a Constitution. Um, each state has their own Constitution. And then you also have the uh, Constitution of the United States of America, the, the one that everybody abides by. So sometimes, you know, I, I would like to get a hold of that Constitution, too. So if I find a copy of that Constitution, I would probably bring it to you all and uh, go over it right here on my YouTube channel. I want to go right over it on my YouTube channel. So if I find where I can get me a copy of that Constitution of the United States of America, I'm going to do it. Believe it. So let's start out with the Constitution. Every state has their own Constitution. Uh, a Constitution is a system of basic laws and principles that establish the nature, functions, and limits of a government or other institution. And law. Law is a body of rules promulgated to support the norms of that society enforced through legal means uh, that is punishment. Okay. What's, oh, it's a term. I, I, I went over this one before. The Mayflower Compact. The Mayflower, Mayflower Compact was a written agreement for self-government signed uh, 
It was signed. This document was the colonist's first attempt at self-government. According to Gun Gunderson in 2003, the original compact had disappeared. However, a version a version of the compact is contained in in contained in of Plymouth Plantation, written between 1630 and 1651 by William Bradford, second governor of the colony, following the spelling and punctuation of the period. The, the Great Melting Pot, representative from every culture that has come to America, regardless of when they arrived or where they came from, sharing in the historical development of our country and legal system. It is a common thread that binds all who have come here, the desire for something better that makes American law so unique in serving the pluralistic society that created it. Okay, just want to, you know, go over some important terms that we should know, you know. Sometimes there's nothing wrong with reviewing. What about the Declaration of Independence? Let's go, go back over this. I know I read before the direct Declaration of Independence where they almost, you know, a lot of their lives were threatened. Even for them just to even sign, you know, Thomas Jefferson and different ones. For them to even sign the Declaration of Independence, their lives were threatened. And that's something I didn't even know until I read that uh, recently. It said, July 1776, after arduous debate, delegates of the Second Continental Congress voted unanimous, unanimously in favor of American independence. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was selected to coordinate writing the formal announcement, the Declaration of Independence. It listed the complaints the people had against Britain. I guess when they spoke up against Britain and all the complaints that they had, their lives were in danger. So they speak against the king, uh, queen, king, queen, you know, in justification uh, for declaring independence. On July the 4th, 1776, the president of the Congress signed the American Declaration of Independence, which formally severed ties with Great Britain. So the Declaration of Independence, that was the time when the United States Several ties with Great Britain. This historic work consists of six important sections. First, the opening paragraph explains why, why the Declaration was issued. That is, the compelling necessity for the colonists to break their political ties with Great Britain. Uh, when, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nations God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to uh, separation. Okay, in the second paragraph, the crucial statement of the purpose of the government declares all men to be equal and to have equal claims uh, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So you remember that movie, uh, I think Will Smith was in a movie, uh, said, and I think he was saying something about uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. One of the movies that he was in, uh, I don't remember that movie, but that's what I remember him saying. I don't know if it was the, uh, I don't know if it was that movie that he played Muhammad Ali in. I don't know if it was that movie. I don't remember. But I know he played Muhammad Ali in one of the movies, and he said, uh, they wanted Muhammad Ali to, I think, fight or something in the army, and he didn't want to fight because he like, y'all don't fight for me over here. Y'all don't fight for me over here, but you want me to go over there in the army and fight and risk my life. So, you know, that's, you know, but so, you know, I wouldn't want to go in the army either for real, but, you know, but, you know, somebody has to do it, you know, somebody has to do it, but I guess we all are not cut out for the same things. But I do honor those that serve, you know, that served in the army for, you know, helping out, helping us, helping the United States, helping us. So I want to thank them for their service. But uh, let me go on. Uh, okay, that's the direct, that's the Declaration of Independence. And right here, as I was saying, what it cost the signers. The men who signed the Declaration were the elite of their colonies. Men of wealth and social standing, they were indeed uh, risking all. Uh, society Declaration of Independence was an act of treason, punishable by death. You know, that's something I never even knew. 
that was an act of treason punishable, punishable by death. Um, because it was so dangerous to publicly accuse their king, the names of the signers were kept secret for six months. Although most of the 56 signers survived the war and many went on to illustrious careers, including two presidents as well as vice presidents, senators and governors, not all were so fortunate. Jacoby uh, 2000 notes that nine of the nine of the 56 signers died during the revolution. Nine of the nine of, of the 56 signers. Man, I didn't know they had they had a whole lot of them signed. Uh, never tasting American independence. So nine of them died during the revolution. Five were captured by the British. Eighteen had their greatest states looted or burned by the British. Carter Braxton of Virginia, an aristocrat who invested heavily in shipping, had most of his ships captured by the British Navy and his estates ruined. He became a pauper. He became a pauper. Richard Stockton, a New Jersey Supreme Court judge, was betrayed, betrayed by his loyalist late neighbors, dragged from his bed and imprisoned. That's terrible. Uh, brutally, brutally beaten and starved. Damn. Oops, excuse me. Uh, brutally, brutally beaten and starved. Uh, okay, his estate was devastated. Although he was released in 1776, his health, <coughs> his health was ruined and he died within five years, leaving his family to live on charity. John Hart, the speaker of the New Jersey Assembly, was forced to flee in 1776 at the age of 65 from uh, the bedside of his dying wife. He hid, a he hid in forests and caves while the British destroyed his home. Fields and, mill and ran, fields and mill and ran off his 13 children. When he returned, his wife was dead. Uh, his children missing and his estate destroyed. He never saw his children again and died, shattered in 1779. Indeed, Americans owe much of those 56 signers of the Declaration. <clears throat> because of their commitment to liberty, the colonists were able to move forward in establishing the foundation for their new free country. Articles of Confederation. The Second Continental Congress not only acted, acted to declare independence, independence for America, <coughs> but also set about to determine how government should be developed. We have Richard Henry, Richard Henry Lee, the delegate who made the revolution, resolution for America to be independent, encouraged, and, uh, encouraged the Confederation of Independent States. So, you know, let's get into it. And so much in this book. This is, this is a nice book right here. So let's get into it. Let me see what else. Uh, the Constitution takes its shape. It can be difficult to grasp all the lies behind the Constitution, Constitution unless one keeps in mind the underlying reason for the Constitution, that is, to provide a system of government that would prevent one individual from having complete power. Understandably, such a system would, <coughs> of necessity, have complexities built into and to achieve such uh, a lofty goal, but the basic reasoning is simple. Issues that became prominent were the structure and powers of Congress, of the executive branch and of the judicial branch. What was sought was an array of checks and balances that would allow the system to work while achieving the primary goal of limiting power to any individual or section of the government. The delegates at the Constitutional Convention who came from uh, varied backgrounds, rose to the challenge. Individual power was never their objective, but rather societal cohesiveness and democratic power uh, to achieve, to achieve one nation with liberty and justice for all. Uh, to achieve one nation with liberty and justice for all. So that's basically what the Constitution is trying to convey. So let me move on from that. The issue of slavery. Slavery uh, if that slavery was in the Constitution. It was it was law. Slavery was law. I mean, can you believe that? 
Slavery. Uh, the issue of slavery was omitted during the constitutional debates. Although none of the frame, framers knew whether this radical document would be ratified, it was known that it would have zero chance of getting Southern, uh, Southern uh, radical document. Wait a minute. Although none of the framers knew whether this radical document would be ratified, it was known that it would it would have zero chance of getting Southern ratification if it dealt with the slavery issue. At the time, slavery was on its way out in many states. Some plantation owners in the South had their doubts about slavery as well. It was not until Eli Whitney's invention of the cotton gin six years later that the demand for slaves greatly increased. As Thomas Jefferson said, slavery is like holding a wolf by its ears. You don't like it, but you're afraid to let it go. The Tenth Amendment, by default, left the slavery issue up to each state. This omission from the Constitution and indirectly the failure to compromise would lead to civil war. And then the Constitution was drafted on Tuesday, August 7, 19, uh, 1787. A draft constitution was ready for a clause by clause review. And then it says uh, descriptions of the debates that forged the constitution during the summer of 1787 in Philadelphia are fascinating. And this is certainly worthwhile reading for those who wish to pursue and further the constitution of the United States. The articles contained in the final draft of the constitution, 1976, page 33. To 41. I want to read an actual copy, you know, but they said 33 to 41. Let me see what they're saying. 33 to 41. Okay, 33 to 41. To the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration, let me see. Let me see if there's anything else over here I need to read. Uh, okay, we have the, um, we have the, legis the legislative branch, uh, the executive branch, and we have the judicial branch. So the judicial is the court system. The executive branch, it says the office of the president was created to carry out the law to provide a commander in chief of the military forces to carry out the nation's foreign policy including entering into treaties with other nations and appointed ambassadors, judges, and officials needed for the government to function. Legislative branch, all legislative powers here in Grand shall be invested in the Congress of the United States. So legislative branch uh, invested in the Congress and executive branch, we had that for the president and then the judicial, we had that for the court system. Um, so let's move on. So then they talk about signing you know, of the Constitution. Overall, I uh, say once the overall format was agreed upon, the next step was to seek approval of the document by the delegates. After hearing the debate over the final version of the Constitution, Benjamin Franklin on Saturday, September 15, 1787, eloquently urged the convention to respect the spirit of compromise, stating, I confess that there are several parts of this constitution that I do not that I do not at that I do not at present approve or at present pre, present pre, uh, approve, but I am not sure I shall ever approve them. For having lived long, I have experienced many instances of being obliged by better information or fuller consideration. So, uh, <clears throat> so in other words, he didn't agree with some of the. Uh, you know, some of the words that were going to be in the Constitution. So, Benjamin, uh, Benjamin Franklin, Saturday, September 15, 1787. Look how many years ago there was a lot of things in the Constitution he didn't, he didn't agree with. But sometimes, you know, it's just like being on a job. You might not agree with uh, how you might not you might not agree with how they do a lot of things around you know on your job or whatever, but won't be nothing you can do. You know you have to uh, sometimes you just have to go 
with the program. But if things get too out of hand and you say, no, you know what? I don't like the way these people operate. Operate. I don't like the way these people operate. I, I don't want to be a part of this culture. So sometimes some organizations, you know, they create a culture that is unethical. You know, I took a course on ethics too, Strad University. Some companies, you know, just like companies will, um, you know, dump, dump, Dangerous chemicals near people's homes, near apartment complexes, you know, apartment complexes. You know, that all that is unethical. So, you know, so, and then, you know, people dumping cancer-causing chemicals near people's homes, you know. So that is definitely unethical. Okay, let me see. So that, that almost finishes that chapter. Well, I'm at 25... Okay, uh, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about the common law, development of the law, the development of societal rules began the first time people congregated, uh, when people are together, a norm established, uh, a norm established so individuals know what is expected of them relative uh, to the group as a whole. People come together seeking collective security to collectively gather food and to satisfy other mutual needs. They discover that they need rules to maintain order and their sense of uh, security. Uh huh. Inevitably, inevitably, some individuals break the rules. Consequences are established by breaking the rules. So let's go over here to the common law. Common law. This system of common law is the basis for American law, where the decisions made in past cases are routinely examined when new cases are considered. So that's what they call um, uh, stand decisis. Um, when you have a, a model case, you know, uh, well, back in the day, uh, what I learned, well, actually, it came out of this book, not this book, no, I think I learned it in this from this other law book that I had. This is my business law book from Strayed University. But, uh, it's, I guess it's in this book too. Yeah, it's in that book too, because that's the one I learned just from when judges went down in the towns. So when the judges went down in the towns and they made, uh, when they solved cases, they solved cases and those cases became, uh, you know, that's what they call stand decisis, let the decision stand. So when they solved those cases, those cases became law. The, 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 I guess the results, the results of those cases be, were written into law. And then they use those, they use those cases as a model case to decide other cases. So that's what they call, that's what they say, stand decisive, let the decision stand. When the judges went down in the towns and they solved cases and then, uh, the outcomes of those cases uh, the outcomes of those cases were used to solve other cases. So they use those, they use one particular case as a model case to solve another case. So I did love law when I was down Stray University and Liberty University. Uh, I did, and I wanted to, you know, get my law degree. So I still pretty much got a lot of stuff fresh in my mind. Stand decisive. American common law has developed by building upon itself. Courts continue to rely on prior cases. That's what I said. Directly by implication or conceptually to maintain continuity. This continuity results not only in current cases, but uh, cases being decided in a way that relates to existing law. This concept is termed stand decisive. Let the decision stand. Meaning that uh, previous rules set for in other cases, shall be used to decide future cases. So there you have it. Stand decisis. It's a Latin term that literally, literally means let the decision stand. When a legal principle has been determined by a higher court, lower courts must apply it to all uh, later cases containing the same or similar facts. Okay, let me move over to, uh, we got the court system, appellate courts and the trial courts. You got the Supreme Court at the top, appellate courts, and the trial court. Um, we got substantive law, procedural law. 
substantive law, establishes rules, regulations, and, and traffic law, how the law is to be enforced is embodied in procedural law. <clears throat> For example, how and when police can stop people is governed by procedural law. Right, they have to follow the right procedure. All uh, right, how they stop people is governed by procedural law. The effects of substantive law being enforced in violation of law can result in serious consequences for the government. The court system. Just as the U.S. Constitution established the federal court system, state constitutions establish their own court system. If I'm saying state constitution, if I'm saying every state has their own constitution, and then when we have one body of law, which is the Constitution of the United States of America. Look what it says, court, um, just as the U.S. Constitution establishes the federal court system, state constitution establishes their own court system with many variations from state to state. Uh, okay, let's talk about uh, uh, the Constitution and the justice, the big picture, the criminal. We have the criminal justice system, then we also have our juvenile justice system. In other words, juveniles. You know, sometimes, you know, when you're uh, looking at the news, you hear them talking about certain cases. They might say, oh, such and such was charged, but they're going to have to be charged as a juvenile because I guess they'd be, they probably was like 18 and under. under eight, I guess it was under 18, you know, they were charged as, charged as a juvenile. Uh, we have standing, then we have moot, mootness, we have standing, having an actual interest in the matter of dispute. So you have a, you might have, some people have a, in other words, if you're in the case, somebody trying to sue you, they might have standing to sue. So that means having an actual interest in the matter of dispute. So if you have, they have an interest in uh, the matter, the matter of dispute. Uh, this is a word right here, a mickers briefs, documents submitted by an individual or organization, not as one of the adversaries, but as an interested Friend of the court. Moot, mootness issues that gave uh, rise to a case have been resolved. Yeah, we have the criminal justice system, the juvenile justice system, law enforcement, the courts, we have corrections. <coughs> That's the end of that chapter. Highest court in the land is the Supreme Court. Uh, <coughs> all cases don't make it to the Supreme Court. All cases, uh, we had a judicial review, the power of the court to analyze decisions of other government entities and law courts. That's a judicial review. Uh, okay, let's see. All right, let's take a step back. Let's see. A chat. Pick up some important terms. Uh, so, you know, let's get into it. Let's get into it. Um, I should have had me something to drink because when I get to do a lot of talking, <coughs> my throat is getting dry. Okay, well, I'm going to jump over here to, let's talk about the knock and announce rule. The knock and announce rule. Officers can break a door or window or break a car window to make an arrest if necessary. But the general rule is that law enforcement officers must first knock and announce the authority and purpose before breaking into a dwelling. This is referred to as the knock and announce rule. But I thought they called it the no knock warrant. But right here it says, uh, uh, well, this don't have to do with a warrant, but it's just a rule, I guess. This is a rule, it's not a warrant. So the knock and announce rule. The intent of this rule is to prevent the occupants from responding with force because they do not know who the uh, intruders are. Depending on the totality of the circumstances in the court having jurisdiction, a violation of the knock and announce rule may make the, uh, may make the entry uh, by police unlawful, thus invalidating the search 
and rendering any evidence found inadmissible as stipulated by the exclusionary rule. The, the intent of this rule is to prevent the occupants from responding with force because they do not know who the intruders are, right? Like when they, uh, I guess, uh, when they, they knock down Breonna Taylor's, uh, door and, I don't know if they knocked it down, but I know they went in there and they started shooting, you know, so they just started shooting and, you know, I uh, uh, heard that she was in bed sleep. But it says the, the knock and announce rule. Uh, officers can break a door or window or break a car window to make an arrest if necessary. But the general rule is that law enforcement officers must first knock and announce the authority and uh, pr authority and purpose before breaking into a dwelling. So in other words, they have to uh, knock, let the people know who they are, say, hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. Knock, let them know who they are. And I guess uh, they only do it one time. They only let you know one time. And after that, that's it. The knock and announce rule not only protects citizens' rights, it can also enhance officer safety in executing a warrant. For example, a plainclothes uh, police sergeant was killed while executing a search warrant when a suspect claimed to have fired on someone breaking into his house. Although the police asserted they identified themselves as police, the prosecution was unable to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the president was not acting in self-defense. So that's the same situation with the Breonna Taylor case. Uh, her boyfriend shot back. Her boyfriend shot back because he thought somebody was breaking in the house. I mean, somebody come kick your door and that would scare anybody. Somebody knocking your door down and then you don't know who it is. And then you trying, you know, for me, I'm here. I'm trying to protect my family as well. So, you know. But, um, so that's how that went. The knock and announce rule. Not. Not, uh, so the knock and announce rule not only protects citizens' rights, it also can enhance officer safety and, and executing the warrant. The question of how long officers must wait after knocking and announcing themselves before forcibly entering has been before uh, the courts. McClure versus United States, 1964, held that there are no set rules as to the time an officer must wait before using force to enter a house. The answer would depend on the circumstances of each case. However, in, United, in the United States versus Banks 2002, the Ninth Circuit, Circuit Court ruled that 15 to 20 uh, second uh, wait after uh, knocking and announcing before a forcible entry was insufficient to satisfy the Fourth Amendment. Hopper 2003, uh, this is a 2003 case. The Supreme Court granted certiorari certiorari and considered the key issue to be not the alleged Fifth Amendment violation, but rather the Fourth Amendment violation. The case uh, United States versus Banks was argued October 15 and decided on December 2, 2003 with the court unanimously reversing the Ninth Circuit Court's decision. Uh, Justice uh, Sauter delivered the court's opinion. So they have, so they really, like they said, they don't have no time when they knock and they identify themselves, say we are police officers of the court, you know. So like I said, they don't have no time praying that they will break in your house, knock your door down. But I think some states are trying to do away with this uh, no-knock warrant. So... Let's go into it. Let's get into it. Use of deadly force. Use of deadly force is restricted to cases of self-defense or public safety. So use of deadly force is restricted to cases of self-defense or public safety. In the past, this was not the case. The fleeing felon rule allowed police officers to shoot to kill any felon who fled to escape arrest. This is no longer true. In Tennessee versus Garner, 1985, the court ruled that law enforcement officers cannot shoot 
Law enforcement officers cannot shoot fleeing felons unless they present an imminent danger to life. But we have seen that been still happening. If you flee in the opposite way and they are not in danger, they should have no right to shoot you and kill you. It says, um, the fleeing felon rule allow police officers to shoot to kill any felon who fled to escape arrest. This is no longer the case. This is no longer the case. Uh, Tennessee versus Garner, 1985. The use of deadly force to prevent the escape of any felony suspects, whatever the circumstances, is constitutionally unreasonable. It is not better. It is not better that all felony suspects die than that they escape. Uh, where the suspect poses no imminent threat to the officer and no threat to others. Um, the harm resulting from failing to apprehend him does not justify the use of deadly force to do so. As Justice White set forth, even deadly force can be exercised uh, in, preventing, in preventing the escape of an individual, but only if the officer has probable cause to believe that the suspect poses a significant threat of death or serious physical injury to the officers or others. So if they in threat, they in fear for their life, is a physical threat, it's a, if it's a threat to the officer, then that's different. See, uh, it says, uh, as Justice White set forth, even deadly force can be exercised in preventing the escape. See, even deadly force can be exercised in preventing the escape of an individual, but only if the officer has probable cause. So in other words, they, if, the, if, uh, if somebody trying to escape from them, from the officer, and the officer can use deadly force if the officer has probable cause to believe that the suspect poses a significant threat of death or serious uh, physical injury to the officer or others. So in other words, if, if, right, if, the officer, in other words, if the officer's life is in danger, then he can use deadly force, even if uh, the suspect is running away. So that's what we have to read up on, because that's why they probably, you know, that's why a lot of cases probably turned out how they turned out when when uh, the uh, felon or the suspect is fleeing and then uh, he fleeing the opposite way but the officer still shot him and killed him. The officer still shot him and killed him in several cases because uh, I guess they're saying that the suspect put their life in danger. So even though he was fleeing from the officer the officer's life was still in danger, so that's why they shot, they shot him and killed him, you know. But that's according to the definition of the book. The officer's life is in danger, even if the suspect is fleeing, then they could, because that's what it say right here. As Justice uh, White set forth, even deadly force can be exercised in preventing the escape of an individual. But only if the officer has probable cause to believe that the suspect poses, poses a significant threat or death or serious physical injury to the officer and others. That's why it's good to read up, to review a lot of this stuff. Immunity from arrest. Or we have immunity from arrest. Many states have granted their legislators immunity from civil lawsuits. Some states even give legislators immunity from traffic arrest on their way to sessions as is the case with federal legislators as well. However, a legislator facing criminal charges has no such immunity. Okay, um, we had 43. Okay, let's go to... Uh, let's talk about the tenant, tenants of Fourth Amendment search analysis. All Fourth Amendment cases, cases begin with two basic conceptual questions. Has the fundamental constitutional uh, rules been met? Does the search fit within one of the permissible uh, realms? The fundamental constitutional rules are unreasonable search and seizures, and seizures are not allowed. <clears throat> People's reasonable expectation of privacy determines where Fourth Amendment protections apply, and general searches are unlawful and restrict government from going beyond what is necessary. And understanding of these three concepts combined with the ability to analyze search and seizure issues will allow an educated uh, response when someone asks. Scope of the searches. 
the, the requirement that warrants shall particularly describe the things to be seized, uh, makes general searches under them impossible and prevents the seizure of one thing under a warrant, describing describing another. As to what is to be taken, nothing is to nothing is left to the discretion of the officer executing the warrant. So, in other words, then when they issue a search warrant, they will have it would be in, it would be specified in their warrant, you know, the area to be searched. Uh, the room to be searched, I guess, the area to be searched, the room, things to be seized, and a person to be seized. So if they're looking for a person, they're looking for certain things, uh, you know, a certain area of the house, a certain certain room, you know. So, uh, again, it is crucial to understand that while the Fourth Amendment generally does not restrict the actions of private citizens, it does apply to all government workers. This includes federal, state, county, and local governmental uh, bodies, just as the FBI, state police, county sheriff, and local police are bound by the Fourth Amendment. So are the IRS, the Postal Service, fire inspectors, local building officials, and code enforcement officials. Searches with a warrant. We got searches with a warrant. If the warrant states, if the warrant states only one specific item is being sought. Once it is located, the search must end. If the warrant states only one specific item is being sought, once it's located, the search must end. So they can't be, uh, once they found, they come, they do a search, they come and they find out what they're looking for, and then, you know, they finish searching, and they, then they still searching, you know, you know, went in the basement. Uh, you know, went up in this other room, but you already found what you were looking for, but you're still around searching. You know, that is an illegal search. Illegal search. So, you know, and then we have uh, administrative warrants. Uh, administrative warrant, search warrant issued to check private premises for compliance with local ordinances. We have searches without a warrant. The Fourth Amendment prefers a warrant because it necessitates judicial review of government action. Uh, thus, the presumption exists that a warrantless search is unreasonable. Uh, searches with consent. And so, in other words, they, ask, they may ask you, can they search you? And, you know, you might say, no, nah, you can't search me. You can't search me. Uh, if an individual gives uh, uh, gives voluntary consent for the police to search his or her person or property, the police may do so without a warrant. Right. So if they ask you, can they search you, and you say yeah, then they don't need no they don't need no warrant because they already asked you, and you said, uh, you know, you said yeah, searches without a warrant. Right. Okay. So let's go to. Oh, let's talk about uh, Fritz. Let's get into it. <coughs> uh, <coughs> the elements of stop and Fritz, the stop and Fritz law, which, uh, which that was discussed in another chapter. Okay, but but are important to include here. What is important to include here uh, is crucial. Is a crucial is a crucial exception to the warrant requirement for a legal search. Recall that if officers have a reasonable suspicion based on specific and uh, art articulable articulable we'll get it right articulable facts that an individual is involved in criminal activity the criminal activity the officers may make a brief investigatory stop if the officers reasonably suspect that a person is presently armed or dangerous a frisk may be conducted without a warrant uh, Terry versus Ohio. That's a case you can read up on. Terry versus Ohio, 1968. A frisk is allowed for the safety of the investigating officer. When an officer is justified in believing that an individual whose suspicious behavior he is investigating at close range is armed and presently dangerous to the officer or to others, it would, it would appear to be clearly unreasonable to deny the officer the power to take necessary measures to determine whether the person is in fact carrying a weapon and to neutralize the threat of physical harm. And then they still have to be careful because, you know, if they think, uh, I mean, they may have a reasonable suspicion that somebody 
you know, they watching this person, say this is the officer just sitting on the corner or sitting over there to the side, and he's just watching, and he just, you know, he run across a suspect, and he might feel that, hey, that's, you know, that gentleman there, he looked kind of suspicious. He, he keep on, you know, he got his hand in his pocket. He keep on messing around with his hand in his pocket, and, you know, I'm, I'm observing him. I am observing him, and he got his pocket kind of bulged out a little bit. You know, he might have a, you know, but sometimes, you know, if it's too dangerous for the officer, then they can't, you know, they wouldn't want to do no stop and frisk. If you feel that somebody got a weapon in their pocket, you know, you can't roll up on people like that. So that's what they're saying. Um, when the officer is justified in believing uh, that the individual who's suspicious behavior, you know, he acting suspicious, suspicious behavior, he is investigating at close range is armed and presently dangerous to the officer or to others. It would appear to be clearly unreasonable to deny the officer the power to take necessary measures to determine whether the person is in fact carrying a weapon. So in other words, just to get that person off the street, you know, you know, you the officer, you suspicious, you see a suspicious person and he's doing, he's acting erratically and he's acting suspicious, suspiciously and, um, you know, you see him putting his hands all in his pocket and, you know, you see some bulging into his pocket and you might feel, hey, you know, this guy might have something in his pocket. He might, he's dangering, he's dangering the public, you know, and the officers. So they can do a uh, stop and frisk in that circumstance. Then we had a plain feel, plain feel, plain, plain feel, plain touch, plain feel or plain touch. Items felt during a lawful stop and frisk may be retrieved if the officer immediately recognizes them as contraband. In the precedent playing field case, Minnesota versus Dickinson, 1993, another case you can read up on. Uh, two, two police officers saw Dickinson leaving a known crack house, and then, upon seeing the officers stop abruptly and stop abruptly and walk quickly in the opposite direction, so he he came out. They they saw him come out of a crack house. His name was uh, Dickinson. And he saw him come out, the officer saw him come out of a crack house and he stopped, he stopped abruptly and, you know, started walking the opposite way. So I guess the officer felt that he was suspicious and he came out of a crack house. They might feel that he had crack in his pocket. So it said, uh, they did, uh, it says, uh, so, uh, upon seeing the officers, he stopped uh, abruptly and walked quickly in the opposite direction. The officers decided to stop Dickerson and investigate further. They did so, and as one officer testified late in court, as a pet searched, as I pet searched the uh, front of his body, I felt a lump, a small lump in the front pocket. But you can't assume that what a person may have in their pocket, because when they come out of somebody's house, he could have came out of the house, he could have met his baby mama up in the house. <laughs> we all know what he did. I mean, you know, you can't, you can't assume that he has something in his pocket because you can't see through his pocket. You don't know. He could have just went in there and wanted to borrow $20 from somebody and came out. He could have met his baby mama in there and said, hey, you know, uh, whatever, you know, uh, I need that letter, you know, I gotta you give me the key, you know. He might have met somebody over there to get the key. Get the key to, to their house or to, to his house or whatever. Like I said, he could have had um, wanted to borrow some money from somebody and they went and got some money. Just because you see a person come out of a crack house, you know, that don't mean nothing. Because I could, I could go in my own house. I could be in my house and come out of my own house. You know, so what's the difference? I mean, I guess, I guess you feel, they feel that it was a crack house. They assume he go in a crack house, he coming out with some crack. You know, that, <laughs> that don't mean nothing. Uh... I say people go in the store, go in the store, don't come out with nothing. So, you know, they go in there, they don't decide they don't want to buy nothing. Or the prices were too high, they go in that store and come out and don't have nothing. Uh, it says, uh, I mean, I have done that myself. Go in the store, just because I went in the store, that not mean I'm going to come out with anything. Uh, it says, uh, 
in the pre in the in the precedent plain field case, Minnesota versus Dickerson. Two police officers saw Dickerson leaving a known crack house. So uh the officer decided to stop Dickerson and investigate further. They did so and as one officer testified later in court, as I as I pet searched the front of his body, I felt a lump, a small lump, in the front pocket. I examined it with my fingers and slid it. And it felt to be a lump of crack cocaine in cellophane. I never thought the lump was a weapon. When the case was appealed to the Minnesota Supreme Court, however, the conviction was reversed. But you can't see through nobody's pocket. You feel around in their pocket. You you feeling around in their pocket, or it might be it might be a piece, it could have been a piece of candy. It could have been anything. The court the uh when the case was appealed to the Minnesota Supreme Court, however, the conviction was reversed. The court held that the sense of touch is much less reliable than the sense of sight uh, and that it is far more intrusive into the personal privacy, uh, personal privacy that is the core of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, the decision was granted review by the U.S. Supreme Court, which upheld the ruling of the Minnesota Supreme Court which, because the officer did not immediately recognize the object as contraband. However, the court did support plain touch or plain feel uh, in fresh situations if contraband is plainly felt by the officer. So that is a case we can read up on. Minnesota versus Dickerson, 1993, uh, plain feel, plain touch. So when he feeling around, the officer feel all around in his pocket. Soon he had crack cocaine in his pocket because he saw him come out of crack house. He could have went in that crack house for a number of reasons. So, I mean, these assumptions are something else. But the court didn't uphold it. So, they got the plain view evidence. The court recognizes that it would be unreasonable to expect police officers to either ignore or to delay acting on something illegal that they see. Objects qualify as plain view evidence if officers are engaged in lawful activity when they find the evidence and it is not hidden. Somebody will the officer roll up on you. And in ordinary course of business and they roll up on you. And they uh you know, you say for instance, you just sitting in your car, you just sitting in your car, and your car is parked on the curb, and they roll up on you. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. They roll up on you and then they just, you know, ask you a few questions, but they happen to see that you have some weed on the side of your, um, uh, uh, you have some weed on your passenger side in the passenger seat. That's plain view. If they see it, that's, they can use that as evidence. They can use that as evidence against you. So, you know, I'm just saying that's just an example. Okay, what the plain view cases have in common is that the police officer and each of them had a prior just justification of an intrusion in the course of which he came excuse me, across a piece of evidence incriminating to, uh, the accused. Accused, the doctrine serves to supplement the prior justification, whether whether it be a warrant for another object, hot pursuit, search in, uh, incident to lawful arrest, or some other legitimate um, reason for being present, unconnected with a search direct directed against. The accused and permits a warrantless seizure. Of course, the extension of the original justification is legitimate only where it is immediately apparent to the police that they have evidence before them. Okay, so searches, incident to lawful arrest. Let's see what else I have in here. Okay, I think that that's just about it. Let's see what else we got. I am tired. It's almost this. Oh, it is 11, 11.35 Central Standard Time. Oh, excuse me. Oh, wow. I want to wrap this video up. Like I said, I went over the, already went over the contract. Uh, you know, six elements to a contract to make it fully enforceable. And um, let me see what else I have in here. I think I'm going to wrap this video up. We have due process of law. We have the Fifth Amendment. Uh, you can plead the Fifth. You know, if you ever arrested, you keep quiet. 
plead the fifth, plead the fifth for, for fear of self-incrimination. You know, wait till your lawyer, um, wait till they uh, appoint you a lawyer. The Fifth Amendment states, no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. That's the Fifth Amendment, due process of law. The Fifth Amendment also states, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. In other words, due process means you have your time in court. You have your court, your time in court. So, Fifth Amendment also states, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without the process, without the pro, without, the, without due process of law. Due process is such an important concept of American law that no precise definition accurately suits it. It is the idea that basic fairness must remain part of the process. It is the right to hear and the right to be heard. The right to hear and the right to be heard. The right to hear and the right to be heard. That's due process. So you have a right to hear their side, and they have a right to hear your side. So right to hear and right to be heard. Uh, then you have procedural due process. First, of how laws are applied. So everything has a certain procedure, a certain system. So when I, well, you, usually when I talk about my uh, my major was uh, information systems. So we talked about computer information systems. So everything, everything follows a system, you know. You have a um, accounting information system. Let's talk about accounting. You have a business information system. Every thing has a system to follow. Business information system. You have accounting information system, and then law. The law field. This is that's a system they have to go by. So they have to. Um, it says a procedure, due process. Though uh, uh, refers to how laws are applied. Those amendments uh, contained within the Bill of Rights. The first ten. The first ten amendments are the Bill of Rights. So let's see what we have next. Uh, we have substantive due process requires laws themselves to be fair. Uh, okay, Miranda. So how did the Miranda rights come about? The Miranda rights came about when um, there was a gentleman named uh, Ernest, Ernesto Miranda. He was arrested for rape. They went to his house, arrested him for rape. Uh, but they didn't read him as uh, Miranda rights. You know, you have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. You have a right to an attorney. Uh, you have a right to your, you have your Fifth Amendment rights. You have a right to remain silent or feel self-incrimination. That's the Fifth Amendment. So they didn't read him as rights. So he was, uh, so that's where they came up with the Miranda rights. Miranda rights. But so it's circumstances. In certain circumstances, they don't have the regional rights. In other words, if they feel one is that if they feel their life is in danger, they don't have to read, you know, or they feel that um, you want to destroy some evidence or something like that, then they're not going to read your rights. They're going, you know, because if their life is in danger. So the law is very, I mean, it's almost it remind me of a county. It's a little tricky. So in other words, you have to read into it. You have to read it over and over again sometimes. Uh, Ernesto, Ernesto Miranda, he was a poor 23-year-old uh, with only a ninth grade education. He was arrested at his home for rape and was taken to the police station uh, where the complaining witness identified him. Sometimes they can identify the wrong person. Within two hours, he signed a written confession. Miranda was never informed of his right to consult with an attorney, uh, to have an attorney present doing questioning or of his right not to be compelled to incriminate himself, which is the Fifth Amendment. Fear of self-incrimination. The legal issue in Miranda was whether the police must inform a suspect who is the subject of custodial interrogation of his constitutional rights concerning self-incrimination and counsel before questioning. So it is a lot to, you know, and when a Miranda right, when a Miranda warning must be given, Miranda took the unique step of actually directing police officers to tell individuals they had in custody before questioning them for a specific warning. You had the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. You had the right to talk to a lawyer now and have him present now or any time doing questioning. And if you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be appointed for you without cost. 
Uh, so then we, I think I'm gonna wrap it up now because I'm at one hour. So it's a case that you can read up on. The same Miranda survives a challenge. Dickinson versus United States. Uh, I think that's going to be it. So I went over. Okay, here goes another turn right here. Well, I think uh, this will be the last turn. Oh, it's a couple other turns I want to go over. Okay, here goes one right here. Entrapment. Uh, I know when they had uh, our mayor, Mayor Marion Barry, when they um, had, uh, when he was in the uh, hotel, and he, you know, I don't want to go into that right now, but it happened with the mayor of uh, D.C., Mayor Marion Barry, Washington, D.C. Uh, it wasn't, it was not entrapment. See, entrapment is a government, entrapment, government officials induced a person to commit a crime that is entrapment when they induce you to commit a crime but if you were going to do it anyway then it's not entrapment so that's that's tricky too you have to read into that in other words if you are known <coughs> excuse me if you are a known drug user or drug dealer then it wouldn't be entrapment because they figure that you are not a you are not a law abiding citizen and you would have done, you would have committed that crime. You would, you would have committed that crime anyway because you are a known user or you are a known drug dealer. So, but it's only entrapment when they, when the government induce a person to commit a crime. Say, for instance, me, I'm a law-abiding citizen. I don't, I don't do drugs. I don't sell drugs. I don't smoke drugs. So if they induce me. Um, into a crime that would be entrapment because I'm a law abiding citizen and I and I don't you know don't sell don't use none of that so that's how that would go. It says due process remains the underpinning of every component of a legal case. Entrapment falls into this category and may be used as a defense to a criminal charge. Entrapment is discussed here because while it can be included in any chapter of certain people's rights, the concept of government. Going too far is what the study entrapment is about. When a, when a defendant admits to committing a crime, he may argue it was law enforcement agents themselves who brought the crime about. The power of government is, is the power of government is abused and directed to an end for which it was not constituted when employed to promote rather than detect crime and bring about the downfall of those who. Left, uh, left themselves might well have obeyed the law. Human nature is weak enough and sufficiently beset by temp temptations without government adding to them generating crime. <coughs> and so we also have, uh, we talk about double jeopardy. So double jeopardy. Uh, the double jeopardy clause has been incorporated into the 14th Amendment. Uh, members' due process clause and thus applies to the states. Its purpose was uh, explained by Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black in Green versus United States, 1957. Uh, the prohibition against double jeopardy prevents the government from trying someone twice for the same offense. Can't try a person twice for the same offense, double jeopardy. And they incorporated it into the 14th Amendment. Uh, okay, let's see what else we have. I think that is it. We have the Patriot Act. Uh, according to Boyd, Boyd Turner, 2003, the Patriot Act dramatically strengthened the ability of the Justice Department and the FBI to monitor suspected terrorists or their associates. This comprehensive, this comprehensive, some, this comprehensive, uh, some would say, sweeping law spans much of the specific topics. This tech. This text addresses because the basis of the Patriot Act is to enable government to access information more readily. It is included here. Uh, okay, I think that is it. That's it. So, but um, a lot of good, a lot of good stuff in this book. But some things, some of these things, I go over maybe in my next video, but um, so 
So we just want to go over a few of these terms, you know. I think that's it. Yeah, so that was almost a whole book. So we talked about the stop and frisk. We talked about we talked about uh, Miranda rights. We talked about uh, let's see, we talked about the uh, uh, illegal searches and seizures. Uh, we talked about you know we talked about different things. So uh, we got cruel and unusual punishment. The final clause of the eight the Eighth Amendment forbids punishment punishments that are cruel and unusual. That's the uh, Eighth Amendment. Uh, so I think I'm gonna stop right here because I'm at one hour, uh, ten minutes. And okay, so that is, I think I'll stop right there. And that's that book right there. So, uh, I want to say thanks for joining me. Glad you could be here. Glad to see you. And uh, so this is a good uh, law book too. So this book right here. There's a book that I use at Australia University. And maybe next time I'll go over some other stuff in this book too. So, you know, a lot of things I can go over in this book too. Look. Tort law. See, tort law is uh, a private, a private wrong. So then we have tort law, we have criminal law, we have civil law, tort law, private wrong, we have a tort, the tort feeser. So uh, we have criminal law, we have civil law. See, tort law, tort is a private wrong, that's what I said. A private wrong that injures another person's physical well-being, uh, property, or reputation. The English word tort comes from the Latin word tortures, which can be translated as twisted, a twisted person. And then if you, <coughs> you commit a wrong, you commit that private wrong, you are considered the tort feeser. The tort feeser. And then, there's a whole lot of terms in this book too. I have uh, assault, false imprisonment, defamation, slander, libel. Uh, we have battery. Battery involves uh, an offensive or harmful, unprivileged touching. So if I, if I if I touch somebody on their shoulder and it's un, unwanted, it's unwanted, and I touch them with that intent to harm, that would be a battery. But if I accidentally touch them, bump into them, and I accidentally bump into them, so oh, excuse me, that is not a crime. There was no intent behind it. Most crimes are built on intent, intent to harm. You accidentally step on somebody's foot or somebody's shoes, you know it was an accident. I'm sorry, but if you intentionally step on somebody's foot. Boom, like that, you intended on harming him, then that's a crime. That could be assault. That could be an assault. We have uh, defamation, slander, libel. So we have defamation of character. In other words, you saying something about somebody that you know it wasn't true, but you defamed their character because you said, you said, just like just saying somebody, or oh, that person, uh, that person has AIDS or that person, you know, something that wasn't true. That's defamation. And then you have uh, <coughs> you have uh, slander. Uh, defamation in a temporary form such as speech is slander. In a permanent form such as writing, movies, video cassettes, or a uh, laser disc that's liable. Liable. So people can't use it to bring a liable suit even if they have suffered no actual loss. So then we have invasion of privacy, actual malice. <coughs> actual malice means that uh, the statement was made or printed either with the knowledge that it was false or with uh, reckless disregard for its truth or falsity. So in other words, you say something about somebody and you know it wasn't true. So you have that that would be considered actual malice. Like I said, it's still defamation of character. And it's just a lot of terms in this book. I have to probably do another video with a lot of these terms too. Because this is a whole lot of stuff in here and there's a lot of terms in this book. 
we have uh, negligence and a certain, a certain amount of uh, uh, elements to negligence too. Contributory negligence, comparative negligence. So a lot of these terms I will go over in my next video. <clears throat> and then I need to get something to drink because my throat is getting dry. And as I said, I went over contracts. Contract is an agreement based on mutual promises between two or more competent parties to do or to refrain from doing some particular thing that is neither illegal or impossible. So it has to be legal. Can't be nothing illegal. So it cannot be anything. So like I said, we have uh, elements, six elements. We have offer, acceptance, mutual assent, capacity. Um, we have consideration, legality. So I will probably go over some of these things. Cause we have, then we have a valid contract, a void contract, avoidable contract, unenforceable contract. Uh, unenforceable contract is one that because of some rule of law cannot be upheld by a court of law. An unenforceable contract may have all the elements of a complete contract and still be unenforceable. It's upheld, uh, it cannot be upheld by a court of law. Because it still have all, it have all the elements, but it's, it's, uh, it was unenforceable. It was unenforceable. So, you know, that was that type that was. Then you had the unilateral contract, the bilateral contract. A breach of contract occurs when one of the two parties fails to keep the promise. In other words, like I said in my example, example, you have five people and the gentleman want us to paint his house. But uh, we all signed the contract. We all got paid. We all was going to get paid. We all were going to get paid. But somebody didn't fulfill their end of the bargain. They didn't live up to their part of the contract. So <clears throat> it was a breach of contract. Uh, then we have implied in law. Implied in law contract. that can be imposed by a court when someone is unjustly enriched. So I guess it, uh, you know, justly enriched, it is used when a contract cannot be enforced or when there is no actual written or or implied in fact agreement. Applying reasons of justice and fairness, a court may obligate one who has unfairly benefited at the innocent expense of another. An implied in law contract is also called a quasi contract. So somebody benefited unfairly. Um, from somebody else, you know, uh, based on somebody else. In other words, unfairly benefited uh, at the innocent expense of another. So they reap the benefits, but at your expense. So that would be what they call a, um, that is an implied in law contract. And implied in law contract also called a quasi contract. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up right here because I am over one hour. And um, that's just so. Then it goes into it. So it gave, it, the book gives me all the elements, all six elements. And then it goes, it has a chapter for each element. So it is a whole lot of stuff. Offer and acceptance is a chapter for that. Legality, capacity, mutual assent. <coughs> So then you have bilateral contracts, face-to-face, -face, uh, then we have face-to-face -face communication, uh, telephone communication, this is the communications of acceptance. So in other words, if, you, if somebody else, uh, you are, somebody's been offered a contract, they can have face-to-face -face communication, telephone communication, communication by the same method used by or offer, communication by a different method from, the, uh, from that used by offerer. Offer all. So in other words, you you can accept if somebody offer you somebody offer you a contract. You can accept it over the phone. I assume. Just say for somebody, somebody say for instance, somebody call you and say, "Hey, will you can you come over here today and clean my house? Can you come over here tomorrow or today or whatever clean my house? I'll give you three three hundred dollars. You know, if you agree, that would you know." And he sound like he's serious. You know, what I when we uh when I first 
took my course uh, law. We took that we were talking about um, the gentleman. He wanted to. Um, he was just playing. So you know, he said, "Well, you know what? Wash my car. I'll give you fifty dollars. You know, just playing." But you know, it wasn't serious. You had to be serious. You had to have that. Uh, I guess they would call it. Well, I basically say you have to be serious. You can't say if I'm, you can't joke and say, "Hey, hey, you know, I give you fifty dollars. Wash my car. You know, wash my car for a week, or wash my car when when you when I come home from work." But you're just joking with them, you know. So it depends on how you say it. If you don't say it in a way way that's enforceable, that's that's authentic, you know, that you can believe that it's a contract, then you know, say, "Oh, that ain't no contract." But uh, that I'm gonna wrap it up right here. So I want to say thanks for joining me, and it was a lot of good terms. So you know, when you come back, I want to say, hey, let's get into it. You know, let's get into it. I want to get into a lot of different things in this book. Uh, I like, you know, law is something. It's a subject that I've always been interested in. You know, I want to go over all the amendments, all 20, 20, 26, 27 amendments. I want to talk about the Constitution. I want to get back into reading that. You know, I want to get back into the Declaration of Independence. Uh, I want to talk about uh, Thomas Jefferson and, uh, you know, all the framers of the uh, Constitution, Declaration of Independence. So I want to get back into all that, you know. I think it's very interesting. But I want to say thanks for joining me today. Glad to see you. Glad you could be here. Glad you could join me. And so I want to say, you know, Work on your, you know, definitions. Uh, if you got any, uh, you know, work on your definitions. What is a contract? Uh, all the elements of a contract. Whatever types of contracts are there. If you have any other information, any updated information that you want to share, you know, comment below, subscribe below. You know, anything you want me to talk about, you know, I'll be glad to talk about it. I don't mind. See, one thing about me, I know how to pick up a book, do my research. I always try to do my research before I, you know, come on, before I uh, upload my videos and, you know, before I upload my videos to my channel or even before I, well, right now, I record it on my computer first, then upload it to my YouTube channel, but I always try to do my research first, but some things come to my mind uh, that, you know, sometimes you have a good memory or sometimes you just need to, uh, you know, do a little bit of research, and then sometimes the rest of it comes back to your mind because you can remember. Say, look, that's what I talked about in my class. That's still in my brain. That's still in my, my brain. So, you know, but sometimes I do still like to read even my accounting books, my business books, my accounting books, my uh, law books. I still like to uh, read, you know, I still like to refresh my memory and just sometimes just go ahead and read a few things and take my little notes. But I want to say thanks for joining me today. Glad to see you. Glad you could be here. And I uh, hope to see you on my next video. So subscribe below, comment below, you know, and uh, I do take donations, Venmo, and uh, I'll put all the information down below. So if you have any ideas, anything you want to talk about on my channel, any other law term, any other law terms you want to you want me to discuss, or if you got any information for me, you know, I don't mind learning. Learning is a never ending process. So as you, you know, I wouldn't say as you get older, but I'm saying you, it's always good to learn, no matter how old you are. No matter how old you remember, there's always going to be somebody older than you. There's always going to be somebody younger than you. There's always something to learn. Always going to be something to learn. So glad to see you. Glad you can be here. Glad you can join me. And I want to say I'll see you on my next video. You all have a good one.